Our first show about Islam on Talk Gnosis, we're going to talk about the Ismailis and we're going to talk about esoteric Islam in general, coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis, I'm Father Tony Sylvia and joining me is Jonathan Stewart. Hello Jonathan. Hello Father. How's the snow? Uh, it's uh, it's unpleasant, but um, let's let's pretend it's summer. And because this is on the internet, maybe people will be listening to it in June. That's so. true. It's uh, it's eternal. Yeah. The internet is eternal, as I like to say. At any rate, we have a very special guest with us tonight. We have Khalil Andani, who is a PhD candidate at Harvard University, studying esoteric Islam, uh, mysticism, uh, and all kinds of things. Uh, welcome, Khalil. Thank you. Great to be here. All right. Well, we're very excited to uh, have you on the show. I was uh, lucky enough to catch a lecture you did, a uh, panel discussion with a few other um, academics a few weeks ago, and, and uh, it was very interesting, and, and I'm glad I got a chance to see it. So thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you. It's my honor. All right. So let's jump right into it. Um, what is Ismaili Islam, and uh, how does it differ a little bit from other, uh, other communities? Sure. Um, so firstly, the... Uh, Ismaili interpretation of Islam is part of Shia Islam. So it's perhaps best to begin with the general difference between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, and the difference between these two uh, interpretations of Islam goes back to uh, the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, they differ over whether Muhammad had a divinely appointed successor or not, and then the nature of authority after Muhammad. And perhaps uh, it's best to simply summarize uh, who is Prophet Muhammad for Muslims in general. Mm -hmm. So Muslims in general, do be they believe that Muhammad was the last of a long series of messengers of God, that Muhammad was the means by which God revealed his word, the Quran, to the world. Um, but we need to remember that for most Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad is more than a fax machine <laughs> for revelation. Uh, and we know this because if we look inside the Quran, we'll find that a number of spiritual duties and functions are given to Muhammad to mm -hmm. perform. So for example, you'll read many times in the Quran, he who obeys the messenger obeys God. So Muhammad has authority on God's behalf, not only when he's reciting the Quran, but when Muhammad you know, made any other decision, it was understood that this is a divinely mandated decision. So Muhammad, as a prophet, is also giving divine guidance. Uh, he's also the interpreter of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So it's not, when he's alive, there's no Quran on paper. Yeah. The Quran is something recited in Arabic. It doesn't exist as a text. You don't have different people sort of reading the text like we do today. So Muhammad is the one interpreting uh, what we today call the Quran. Um, but it goes further than that. Uh, Muhammad also has a role as a spiritual mediator between God and the believers. So there's many Quranic verses where Muhammad plays a role in atonement. He has to intercede. He has to pray for the people so they find God's forgiveness. Uh, Muhammad's role is to purify people as well. So I'm saying all this because if Muhammad passes away, what about all these functions now? Mm -hmm. So he's the last prophet, so no one will come and bring new revelation, but there's all these spiritual duties and functions. And this generated different responses. Muhammad at the same time is a political leader. Mm -hmm. He's a leader of a city, Medina, which expands. So um, when Muhammad died, eventually there come to be two responses. The Sunnis say, and they're the majority today, that there is no divinely mandated successor to Muhammad. It's really up to the community to decide how political authority, religious authority, spiritual authority will work out. Mm -hmm. And the Sunnis will work out a, a, a sort of a system of authority uh, and political authority, all this. Shia Muslims, today there's at most 20% of the Muslim world is Shia. We don't have exact numbers, probably less. Shia Muslims say Muhammad, by divine command, designated a successor to all these religious spiritual functions. And Shia Muslims maintain on the basis of statements um, in Muslim tradition that the Prophet Muhammad is said to have made, which Sunnis also affirm, but they interpret differently, 
And these statements include Muhammad telling the community to hold fast to the Quran mm -hmm. and his family. And a second statement is where Muhammad says, according to both Shia and Sunnis, that his cousin and son-in-law, Ali, so his first cousin, Ali, who marries Muhammad's daughter, so now he's his son-in-law as well. So Muhammad declares that Ali is the master of the believers in the same way Muhammad himself was the master of the believers. Mm -hmm. So some Muslims, who today are called Shia Muslims, believe that this is a statement about succession, mm -hmm. that now Ali inherits the spiritual authority and the political authority of the Prophet Muhammad upon his death, and that he has the right to be obeyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, some of the earlier, the earliest followers of Ali saw him as a divinely guided leader, someone who had divinely ordained authority. But it, when Ali dies, on the same basis, uh, many of his followers believe that his religious authority should continue. Mm -hmm. And Ali's sons are also Muhammad's descendants. Yep. Uh, so the succession goes to Ali's sons. Uh, it's believed Ali designated uh, his sons to succeed him. And then it goes then to the next generation mm -hmm. where each of these figures, and the Shia refer to them as Imams, mm -hmm. Imams with a capital I. Uh, so each of these leaders who inherit this religious authority called the Imamate, they are seen by Shia Muslims as divinely guided Imams, authoritative interpreters of Islam. Mm -hmm. That the true interpretation of Islam comes from these Imams. And each Imam is believed to designate one of his sons as the next Imam. So this is what you see here are two different models of authority. Mm -hmm. The Sunni model tries to uh, continue Muhammad's verbal teachings as reported, and they use that as a basis to interpret the religious law as well as the Quran. Mm -hmm. Shia Muslims are following an interpretation coming from these hereditary Imams. Uh, what happens, of course, as history unfolds, is when certain Imams died, more than one son claims to be his successor. Sure. Mm -hmm. This leads to schism, understandably. And in the sixth generation from Ali, so when the fifth Imam dies, there's a contestation, a, a dispute over who's the proper, who's the true sixth Imam. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ismailis followed a particular son of the fifth Imam called Ismail, mm -hmm. and they recognized him as, his, as the succeeding Imam. Mm -hmm. So they take their name from that mm -hmm. recognition. And another group who are the majority Shia called the Twelvers, they followed another son. So they, they did not follow Ismail, they followed Ismail's younger brother. So now you have the fifth Imam in common for most Shias, and then it sort of splits sure. Ismaili's Twelvers. Mm -hmm. Twelvers go on to follow only 12 Imams. The 12th Imam of that line disappears in the 870s and they continue to await that Imam. So the majority of Shia today in countries like um, Iraq, Iran, uh, and sizable uh, populations in Syria, Bahrain, are 12 or Shia. So there's no visible Imam for them. Mm. But this other Shia group which recognized Ismail continue to recognize descendants of Ismail, mm -hmm. generation upon generation as their Imams. They followed these Ismaili Imams' interpretations of faith, which of course um, continues for the next you know, 1,200 years uh, to the present day. Mm -hmm. And in the current time, uh, now Ismailis themselves will undergo schisms, so there'll be another schism where one group follows another line and one group follows one line. And the group that is today known as the Nizari Ismailis, and these, these terms, Ismaili, Nizari, all referring to a certain sch right. schism that took place. So the Nizari Ismailis today recognize a present living Imam from uh, an unbroken line of Imams going back to Ali mm -hmm. and Prophet Muhammad through Ismail. Mm -hmm. uh, and that living Imam uh, is Shah Karim al Husseini. He has the title of Aga Khan. So that's sort of um, the, the origin, the sketch. 
But because the Ismailis follow a living imamate, their practice of Islam actually is evolving continuously mm -hmm. because this living imam and his representatives are interpreting mm -hmm. uh, religious practice. They're interpreting the Quran on an ongoing basis. So is Ismaili interpretations of Islam are quite fluid uh, through history. They're evolving uh, in a different way. It's not as legalistic as you find in other branches of Islam because there's, there's for example, no need for jurisprudence when you have a living imam yeah. uh, interpreting Islam, usually not on a, f a purely legal basis, but more on an ethical basis. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of like the sketch. But of course, within this tradition, uh, there are some very important uh, cultural and intellectual contributions that uh, the Ismailis have made to, to Muslim thought. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some of those. So um, <coughs> we, share, uh, we share the word gnosis in common. Uh, I, I think that that's uh, what a lot, of our, uh, a lot of our viewers are here to, to find out about. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of the esoteric parts of Ismaili Islam? Sure. So uh, the word gnosis, of course, um, in Arabic, uh, the equivalent word is marifa. So very early in the Shia tradition in general, uh, it was recognized that the gnosis, the marifa of God, is the ultimate goal mm -hmm. of human existence, the gnosis of God. Mm -hmm. Then it's a question of, okay, how does, that, how does one attain this? So there's a, a saying, uh, you could some call people call it a very Delphic saying, a saying uh, attributed to the Prophet Muhammad and to Ali. And the Prophet and Ali say, he who knows or recognizes himself mm -hmm. recognizes his Lord. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's self-gnosis and there's gnosis of the divine and they're related. Mm -hmm. Now the Shia position, especially the Ismailis, they then maintain and they say, okay, to attain self-knowledge and gnosis of the divine, one must attain gnosis of the imam. Mm. So the imam is the gate, the mediator toward self-gnosis and gnosis of God in two ways. Uh, firstly, the role of the imam practically is to guide the, dis the believer through both a uh, theoretical teaching, an ethical teaching, and a set of religious practices that and of course, in the pre-modern view, religious practices are not p only symbolic, they work on a person, mm -hmm. right? They, so they transform uh, the self. Mm -hmm. So the idea is by following this uh, regime of knowledge and praxis and ethical action that the imam guides, uh, the disciple will transform his or her self or soul to be capable of gnosis. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. At the same time, the, why is the imam the one who can guide you toward the gnosis of self and divine? It's because the imam al always has it. Mm. So Ismailis have explained historically that the imam is a recipient of, uh, he's a human being, of course, but he's a, uh, an enlightened human being, a recipient of illumination, of spiritual mm. illumination. So the imam is the possessor of gnosis as well as the guide to gnosis. Mm. Uh, therefore, the idea is that one can attain gnosis through the imam. And let me just clarify, in, in Arabic, the word for knowledge is ilm, mm -hmm. the word for gnosis is marifa. And ilm, knowledge, is the more sort of theoretical, mm -hmm. what we would call discursive knowledge. Mm -hmm. And marifa is a knowledge which is supra-discursive. Yep. Right? It's knowledge where the subject has direct knowledge of the object without mediation. So a good example of marifa that every human being has, according to the tradition, is your awareness of your own selfhood. Mm -hmm. right? We're directly aware of the self. Mm -hmm. Nobody has, you, you don't know your, your own self through a representation of it. So that's gnosis. Mm -hmm. So gnosis, it's, I, I want to just clarify that. So gnosis is not some thing that's removed from the world, mm -hmm, right. right? It's something that's, that's natural, in a sense. Hmm. Perfect. Um, oh, yeah. Do we have time to uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the Ismaili Islam 
esoteric interpretations of, of uh, certain aspects of Islam, like say the pillars of Islam and some of the texts and the rituals, I, I understand that there is uh, a sort of an esoteric layer that's explored to these these common aspects of Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. It's a it's a very important part of Ismaili thought, uh, and it the Sufis are also involved in in the esoteric interpretation. So, firstly, what like what are we talking about when we say esoteric, exoteric? So um, some of the earliest texts that we have from the Ismailis uh, describe the whole physical universe mm -hmm. as a set of symbols. Mm -hmm. Symbols that are um, anagogic. So the symbol points towards a spiritual realm, mm -hmm. right? the realm of Gnosis, you could call sure. it. So you have this idea, uh, there's a the physical world and there's a spiritual world. The physical symbolizes the spiritual. Now, human it's beings. Neoplatonic. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a correspondence, and some Christian Gnostic traditions, uh, you know, believe in this too. Mm -hmm. uh, but human beings, for whatever reason, uh, were not able to naturally remember this sort of correspondence, and that was the need for revelation through prophets. Mm -hmm. So a prophet is a Gnostic, in a sense, this a, a being who possesses Gnosis. Mm -hmm. But in addition to, to possessing Gnosis through spiritual vision, the prophet is able to, in a way different from other humans, create a representation of the spiritual order mm -hmm. that's very appealing, that has rhetorical power, that has symbolic power. That representation, the uh, record of that is what we call scripture. Uh -huh. The Quran for Muslims is the last of these revelations. Mm -hmm. So the Prophet Muhammad, by divine inspiration, um, brings the Quran as a representation of Gnosis, mm -hmm. of the spiritual order. But then that's just the first step. Then people have to then go from the Quran and whatever the Prophet says in terms of rituals to uh, the goal, to knowledge of the spiritual world. Because the idea in this tradition is one will attain the Gnosis of God only through a step-by-step -step ascent of the spiritual realm. So you need Gnosis of all these intermediaries. So the role of the Imam and his rep teaching representatives is to unveil to the believer the correspondence between the Quran and the spiritual realm. Mm. That's called esoteric interpretation. But here's the thing. The spiritual realm, as many of you would agree, cannot be exhausted by language, sure. even mm -hmm. when you are you're talking about it in the most philosophical way. So there's so many ways to describe the spiritual realm. One could say it has 10 intellects, or it has three levels, or, or how many. Uh, Kabbalah is even more complex. Yeah. So we're talking really of three levels now. There's the exoteric, the symbols. Mm -hmm. Then there's the end, the spiritual realm, that's the goal. And then there's this middle level, the mesoteric. Mm. And you used to say the cumulative, the cumulative tradition of, of Ismaili thought and all esoteric interpretations is this mesoteric realm. Because they're, they're talking about the spiritual realm, mm -hmm. but they're doing it in different ways based on different times. And I'll give you just a couple of examples um, from the Quran. So um, the uh, verses on gender. The Quran itself was revealed over 23 years mm -hmm. to a society where patriarchy was the default. Yep. Women did, most women, except for the nobles, but most women did not enjoy rights when the Quran was revealed. And if you read the verses of the Quran about gender very carefully, what they're really doing is they're trying to put limits on the patriarchy. They're trying to turn the patriarchy around. Mm. But the Quran in 23 years will not fully do it. Right. It'll just begin. Mm -hmm. So you have verses in the Quran that by today's standards, for example, will still sound uh, patriarchal. So in Surah 4, verse 34, you read, men are in charge of women by the right of what God has given one over the other. You know? Mm -hmm. Now, people today will say, well, this still sounds like patriarchy, but, but back then, uh, and this verse goes on to say that, you know, men have to take care of women. Mm -hmm. Now, in 7th century Arabia, that's a novel idea, that men owed, owed, owed a duty of care. But after the 7th century, the verse literally interpreted uh, looks patriarchal. So one example is how esoteric interpretation looks at this verse. And the Ismailis of the 11th century said, 
men and women in this verse is not just referring to biology. Mm. The word man here is an allegory for the possessor of gnosis, for the teacher. Mm. And the word woman is a symbol for the seeker of gnosis, for the disciple. So when the Quran says men are in charge of women by right of what God has given one over the other, esoterically it means the possessor of gnosis, the teacher is in charge of the disciple mm -hmm. because God has given the teacher gnosis. So that's just an example of how esoteric interpretation can come in and offer a fresh take um, on the revelation. And, and for something like prayer, um, the Muslim namaz, mm -hmm. uh, it begins where the uh, person in prayer raises his hands to his uh, ears and declares God is great. Uh, the esoteric interpretation looks at that gesture and it says, well, the act of raising the hands to the ears, and this is the beginning of the prayer, mm -hmm. so that represents the beginning of the spiritual journey where the disciple is pledging obedience to his teacher. Mm -hmm. And the act of touching the ears with the hands, that's a symbol for saying, of the disciple saying to the teacher, we hear and yeah. we obey. Mm. And that's just one example of how esoteric sort of interpretation works. So you see, esoteric interpretation is not this airy-fairy, you know, Care Bear-ish <laughs> type of talk. It's actually very, very specific, mm -hmm. you know. It's very concrete um, in, in terms of its actual meaning. Yeah, I think a lot of the, um, the early Gnostics would have recognized kind of exactly that because that's what those communities were doing back then. They were looking at the scriptures that existed and saying, yeah, but what that saying is, you know, you hear that in church, but when we come here to our little club, we talk about these. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And we'll talk a lot more about it in the podcast section, but we're out of time for this uh, first part. Um, so uh, thank you once again for joining us. Would you like to tell everybody where they can find you on the Internet and uh, if they wanted to get in touch with you or email address or Twitter or anything you'd like yeah, to share uh, with somebody? For those who are on academia.edu, you can find my uh, academia page. Uh, any Google search will bring up uh, uh, certain of uh, my academic talks on YouTube uh, and, and you know, you'll see my uh, contact address there. But I look forward to you know, engaging with people afterwards. Yeah, it's great. I, we, we send a lot of people to academia.edu. <laughs> <laughs> we sure do. All right. Well, then that's all the time we have for this video portion. Stick around for the podcast, which will be released in a couple of days. Unless you're listening to this in June, it's already out. So go find it. And uh, for those of you who are view watching along at home, we will see you next week. Good night. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.